So, hello and welcome and thank you so much for coming along. It's been quite a journey and all those little railway sayings like staying on track, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel, not being a train wreck, all applied to me during the writing of this book. So, well, during lockdown, it seemed to me like a good time to get myself together and start writing about the history of Honganui East. And as I was trawling through the thousands and thousands of um, references and old newspapers, I kept coming across the East Town Workshop, so I started making notes. And then by the time I'd finished writing notes, I had 50 pages worth of stuff about East Town Workshops, and I'd become absolutely fascinated by it. And I thought, gosh, this is too much to put in a book on Hanganui East. I really need to write a book about it. Which was, you know, thinking back on it a little bit stupid because I didn't think about railways. <laughs> Um, nothing at all other than that a train consists of a locomotive and carriages or wagons behind it. So it's always been um, my idea to put money back into the community that supported me over the years, all the books that I've written. And I wrote one a few years ago on my Pippi Iron Sands about which I knew nothing and it turned out okay. So I thought, well, we'll give it a crack, we'll give it a crack for East Town Railways workshops. And, um, and then I thought, well, obviously the money needs to go to some organisation that's, that's still working with, with, the, with the old technology and um, is preserving our history. So I typed in STEAM and um, Wanganui and TRAIN, I think, and it came up bingo with, um, with the organisation that we're supporting today, the STEAM Rail today. And I thought, well, it must be meant to be then. So. I'm not quite sure whether I emailed them or I can't remember how I got in touch, but anyway, I rocked down there one day to pitch them the idea about publishing this book and them having the profits. And, you know, I guess if some old bird rocked up to my business and wanted to write a book about something that I was an expert on, I'd look at them kind of a little bit sideways, but they didn't. They were just so accepting and so wonderful and so warm and so supportive. And I thought, oh, this is just sweet, you know, I'm in. So the next person I went to see was Graham Carter, and when I explained to him that I was writing this book as a fundraiser, I did see a little flicker of fear shoot across his eyes, which he concealed very quickly. And I said to him, and of course, for it to be any good, you'd have to ask you to help me, Graham. And he said he would, and he did all the proofreading for me from the perspective of the railway history. And, and gave me stuff from his collections as well. And just having his name behind me opened a lot of doors, so I'm very grateful. So, um, Grain became my Railways Histories man. And then many years ago, Alex Bomanis had given me his father's story to read, or to look at, I can't remember why. And I, in it, he'd written about working at the workshops, and I didn't know anybody who worked at the workshops, and I used to work with Alex, so I thought, oh, well, I'll contact Alex, and it's just so lucky. For every book I write, there's always somebody who is the keeper of the past, and they collect all the articles and all the references and all the photographs that they can, and in this case, it was Gunnar's Bomanas. So, so grateful for that, because it filled in a lot of gaps. That, uh, that people either didn't know or couldn't remember. And then I would ring up Alex and I'd go, oh, it's Lorraine, he'd go, hello, Lorraine. And I'd be thinking he's probably going, oh my God, it's her again. <laughs> <laughs> but he's so sweet and so nice. And um, and then I actually galvanised him into not only writing bits for me, but to make contact with people and get their stories as well. And so much of the history from the 1970s on, you've got really courtesy of the Bonanus family. And then there was Hamish um, from Steamer Wanganui, who sort of took on, he's our guard today, looking very sharp for your ears. Look good. You know, you've got to watch these railways, people. <laughs> um, doesn't he look great, though? Yeah, yeah. takes you right back to the day. Um, he, he became sort of the, the liaison person between Steamrail and myself and was 
really, really, really helpful and came up with the idea of collecting um, some interesting little funny stories, which I ended up making into a chapter, which was a great idea. And it's quite a lonely job being a writer, and often I write at night because it's really quiet, and I'd get stuck on something and I would just Facebook him and he'd say, I'll get back to you, and he'd send it around the troops and it would come back to me in about 15 minutes, and I felt really supported throughout that. So thank you very much, Hamish, for, for all of the work that you did. So Hamish really became my, my one man. And then, of course, there's Lindley Fowler, who's sitting down there with a mask on, looking very modest. But <laughs> I could not write books without Lindley because she's my proofreader. So I have um, Graham for all the railway stuff, I have Alex for all the workshop stuff, and Lindley for you better write it properly stuff. So um, thank you for being here today, Lindley, and for your continued support, which has been really, really amazing. So the um, I've done the book in 20-year blocks. They, they take the centenary from 1880 when New Zealand Railways was formed, but actually there was work on site for a few years before that well, with engines that were working on the main rail tracks through to Turakina. Um, so it's a little bit older than, than people think it is. And the actual rail shop, railway workshops has had a very interesting history because they started off in the middle of a depression in New Zealand in the 1880s. So it didn't really pick up steam probably till about the 1900s and just got going and then World War I came along and we've got the lovely um, display board up there, the people who went to the, to the war from the workshops there. And, um, and then after the war there was the, the flu epidemic and then there was a 1921-22 depression so things weren't so good and then they just got on their feet again and in 1925 the Bay Raven report came out which is something that really changed the face of railways and not in a good way and had a terrible impact on East Town workshops because it virtually drove them to their knees. And then we had the depression and then after the depression things really picked up and then World War II came along and they had to manpower people in to take the place of men that had gone to the war. And in fact railways um, even used to challenge the fact that their men had to go to the war because they were an essential industry. And then after the war it picked up and the 50s was the boom time, the 60s was great and from then on it sort of went downhill. And then with the deregulation of the transport industry that, that pretty much sailed to the, sailed to the end of, you know, of East Town's life. So it's really interesting reading and I know that people will probably just wonder with the pictures. But if you do read about it, there's some really, really interesting stuff and some really interesting stories and a few scandals. The thing that I found really disconcerting was that I couldn't actually walk around East Town and see it how it was on this day. I had to try to visualise it in my head. And it wasn't until I went down there and stood beside one of the buildings and thought, my gosh, this is enormous. And I know it wasn't the biggest one there, but I got a sense of how huge this place really was. And of course, nothing can capture the sounds of it. It must have been a very noisy place as well to work. And, um, yeah, it was a shame that I, I could never quite get my head around what it was like to work there because I couldn't see that how it used to be. But I did go down and have a ride on a jigger just to get the railway experience. And from time to time I walk along the railway tracks looking for the fillings that fell out. I, I just don't know how people went to work on those every day. It would have been really difficult. So, oh, let me just see where I'm up to now. Oh, the end, isn't that good? Um, <laughs> The function of buildings did change quite a lot and new departments got set up as time came on and keeping track of those was, was really a nightmare and um, we, we, we did the best that we could. Um, the, the book has been quite a journey and I, I think back now to my first conversation with Graham Carter I'd been writing out of the newspapers, they talked about cars, carriages and trucks for wagons back in the earliest days. And he said to me, Lorraine, you can't write cars and trucks, you've got to write carriages and wagons, or people will think you know nothing about railways. And I went, Graham, I don't know anything about railways. The minute I open my mouth, they're going to work that one out. <laughs> but I think I have learned quite a lot. So um, it's been really a pleasure to meet so many people who have helped me along the way. I mean, Amy Eldon and Ray Dennis have, have, have been the subject of many emails and, and phone calls and have been really wonderful. 
and too many other and too many other people too numerous to mention. But thank you for support. Thank you for being here, and please get this book out to the community and tell people about it because we really want Steam Rail to do well out of this. So thank you very much. Thank you.